Hello, everyone. I'm Beth Clarkson, director of the Pittsburgh Public Library. Thank you for joining us for Backyard Chickens 101, How to Raise and Care for Your Chickens. We are so excited that you're here with us today. Uh, and we are especially excited to partner with the K-State Research and Extension Office for today's program. Here to tell us all about how to raise and care for chickens is a Dave and Scrantz, who is the Diversified Agriculture and Natural Resources Agent for the K-State Research and Extension Office. That's a mouthful. And yes, anyone, it is. <laughs> if anyone has question, questions for a Dave and throughout the program, you can type them into the chat feature and we'll get to those. A Dave and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me and for inviting K-State Extension to partner with you on this program. I will start sharing my screen here so everyone can see the presentation. Is everyone able to see that okay? Okay. Now if I can move to the next slide. There we go. Today we'll get started about chickens and caring for them by talking about what type of chickens. If you're interested in raising chickens, you may be interested in raising them for egg production, for meat production, or you may be interested in showing them at your local fair or specialty poultry shows around the country. If you're interested in egg production, you can use eggs, of course, in your own home, sell them at farmer's markets, and of course, share them with family and friends. If you have an overabundance of eggs, that is more than what you and your family consume. Broilers are referring to chickens that are raised for meat. These again, you can raise for use in your own home or you can sell them to your neighbors and friends and family. If you're interested in raising and selling broilers, you can contact us at the Extension Office and I can give you more information on how to become certified to sell meat through the Kansas Department of Agriculture. And then there's also dual purpose breeds of chickens, which can be raised for both eggs and meat. And then of course, as I mentioned earlier, chickens can also be raised for competition. I'll be getting a little bit more in detail about each of these types of chickens as we go through the presentation today. Um, first, I wanna talk about the two different options when it comes to starting out raising chickens. You can purchase chicks from the local feed store or a hatchery online, or you can also purchase adult chickens from possibly a friend or a local or someone local in your community. This will depend on if you want hens to produce eggs right away, or if you're okay with waiting a few months until those hens reach maturity and start laying eggs. Broilers, because of their fast growth rate, you would purchase those as chicks and then raise them until they're mature and ready to be butchered. We'll start off by talking about egg breeds of chickens. This is some general information. Hens will start to lay eggs at about four to six months of age once they reach maturity. To lay eggs, hens need 14 to 16 hours of light per day to maintain laying. And this is why during the winter time when daylight hours are decreased, they will lay fewer eggs. On average, six hens will lay about three to five eggs per day. This will give you an idea of how many hens you're, you would want depending on how many eggs you and your family use or if you're wanting to sell eggs. Hens reach peak egg laying production at eight months of age, and the typical lifespan of a hen is five years. Sometimes they do live longer, however, their egg production will decrease at five years of eggs. Five years of age, my apologies. It's important to gather eggs daily and to clean and refrigerate eggs after you have gathered them. A rooster is not necessary for egg production. However, if you're interested in raising your own chicks, you will need a rooster to fertilize those eggs. Now a little bit about the different breeds of 
chickens for egg production. There are, of course, different colors of eggs. So we'll go through the breeds based on the colors of their eggs. We'll start off with brown egg layers. I have the different breeds listed here on the slide, as well as a couple pictures of a few of the different breeds. As you can see from the pictures, they come in a variety of colors depending on the breed. And as we go through these breeds, I encourage you to research the different breeds to see which one will be the best fit for you, or it may even be which breed you like the look of the best. Next are the dark brown egg layers. There's only three breeds that lay the deep dark brown eggs. And they are all shown here in the pictures as well. And then of course we have the white egg layers here. There are four of those breeds also represented in the pictures. And as you can see, most of these breeds are white with the exception of one, which is white with black speckles. And last, we have the tinted egg layers. These are also referred to as Easter egg chickens. These are the Americanas and they produce eggs in shades of brown. Which usually it's a light brown, more similar to a tan color, green and blue. Both of the pictures on, these, on this slide are Americanas so to represent the, that they can come in different colors. Next, we'll talk about the meat breeds, starting off again with general information about these breeds. Cornish cross meat chickens are usually butchered at six to 12 weeks of age. This is the most common type of meat chicken that is raised. Other meat breeds grow, grow slower and are ready at 11 to 12 weeks of age. Young birds such as the Cornish cross are more tender while older birds are usually tougher, but they may have more flavor. So depending on what you're looking for and the size of chicken you're interested in having in your freezer, you may choose to go with the Cornish cross or another breed that will be slightly larger. Here are the different breeds of chickens that can be raised for meat. Of course, any chicken can be raised for meat. However, the meat breeds have been developed and selected over the years to have a fast growth rate, a good feed conversion, and they are a thicker boned, bigger bird, while the egg laying breeds are smaller and more refined in their build. The broiler strains have the best growth rate and feed conversion. Cornish crosses are the most common. There's a few different ones listed here and different hatcheries may have different options. They're usually four and a half to five pounds when they're mature and ready to be processed. And then we have the roaster strange, stra strains, sorry, kind of stumbled over that word, which are six to eight pounds when butchered at eight or 12 to 18 weeks. They are about four to five weeks older than the broiler chickens, which when they're processed, which makes them more suitable for roasting. And of course, we have the dual purpose breeds. Dual purpose breeds are breeds that can be raised for both egg and meat production. Typically, the hens are raised for egg production. And while they don't lay as many eggs as the specific egg breeds, they do lay reasonably well. And the roosters in dual purpose breeds are the ones chosen to raise for meat production as they're bigger than the hens. Dual purpose breeds are usually hardier and live slightly longer than other breeds. They usually have calmer dispositions and they are a good choice for a backyard flock. Here is a list of the dual purpose breeds. There are eight dual purpose breeds. And again, I have a few pictures here just to show the variation between the different breeds. And lastly, we'll talk about breeds for exhibition. Of course, any of the breeds listed previously can be raised for exhibition. 
And on the next slide, I'll show you a few other breeds that are considered more solely for show than they are for either egg or meat production. This can be a great hobby or even a project if, for your kids if they're interested in being involved in 4-H. With this hobby, you'll need to learn how to select and breed the perfect bird. As in the shows, chickens are judged on their confirmation and also on how well they meet breed standards. So if you're interested in showing chickens, eventually you'll need to acquire stock from possibly a specialized breeder if you plan to compete in larger shows and want to be more competitive. Here are a few of the breeds of ex for exhibition. I chose a couple pictures here to give you a representation of what the different breeds can look like. I think they are pretty fun looking chickens. They have different styles of feathers than your typical chickens that are raised for egg production. And I know a lot of kids when they're getting involved in 4-H projects, they like these breeds of chickens just because they're fun to look at. And of course, these chickens will lay eggs that you can use in your home. They're just not as well known for their egg laying and won't produce as many eggs as the breeds that have been developed for egg production. And because today we are talking about raising chickens in your backyard, and in recent years, backyard flocks have become increasingly popular and more and more cities are allowing individuals to have um, four hens or a couple hens in their backyards. These are the top six breeds for backyard flocks. They're each represented in the pictures here and they are Plymouth Rock, Araconda, Australorp, Rhode Island Red, Buff Orpington, and Red, Red Sex Link. So this may help you narrow down a little bit what breed might be right for you. And of course, you don't have to choose just one breed to raise for your backyard flock. You can choose several breeds if you desire. And um, you can also talk to different people that raise different breeds and see what they like about the breed or maybe don't like about the breed. And well, as you're researching these breeds, you may find one that will fit your needs a little bit better. And each breed has certain characteristics that they're known for, whether it's heat tolerance, laying a few more eggs than the other breeds, or just having a good disposition. Next, we will cover housing. Housing is a very important part of raising and caring for any animal, as we wanna make sure they have adequate shelter and will be protected from any rain, wind, or this summer heat. As we go more in depth about housing, we'll be discussing space needs, housing types, predator protection, ventilation, lighting, and then nest boxes and roosts, as these are all considerations to think about as you prepare for getting your chickens. First up, we have the housing types. Brooders are for raising chicks. I won't go in depth today on raising chicks as it's a little bit more time consuming than the time we have for this presentation today. But if you are interested in raising chicks or have any questions, um, please reach out to me and I would be happy to visit with you about that. So once the chicks are grown and are adults, there are a couple different housing options. First, we have a hen house, which is the picture represented in the top left-hand corner of your screen. A hen house can have or not have an outside run. In the picture I have on this slide, it has an outside run connected to it. And this is for birds only. So it's of course not big enough for us to walk into, but it will have a roof or a similar opening where you can collect the eggs out of the nest box and also be able to clean it out. And then we have the chicken tractors, which my box may be, hopefully you can see it now. So chicken tractors are bottomless movable pens with housing attached. As you can see 
in this picture. And these are ideal if you have limited space and only desire to have a couple of chickens. And then of course we have a chicken coop, which is large enough for humans to enter in this bottom picture here. Before you build your desired type of housing for your chickens, you can decide if you wanna build it new. There are several plans available for chicken tractors or houses or coops available on the internet and you can find many of those plans for free. You may also be able to acquire and refurbish if needed a chicken coop or house from someone that is no longer raising chickens. You can also buy a kit and assemble it yourself. And of course, you can also buy a finished unit. On this chart here, it gives the space requirements needed for a chicken. For the smaller breeds, they need an outdoor area of eight to 10 square feet per bird, eight, eight square feet if it's a smaller breed, 10 square feet if it's a larger breed. And outside area is referring to the outside run of the chicken coop, or if you decide to go with more of a pen setup with the chicken coop in the middle, then it would be referring to that space. And the indoor area needed for chickens is three to four square feet, again, depending on the size of breed. So that is something to keep in mind when you're deciding which style of housing to go with or designing your coop to build it yourself. Other housing considerations is as you raise chickens, you wanna make sure the housing is clean, dry, draft free, and will be comfortable for the chickens year round. Having a larger space lessens odor, flies, and chance of disease. So while you're designing your coop, you may wanna make it a little bit bigger than what's needed for the number of chickens you'll have. It's also recommended to use pressure treated lumber for wood that will be in contact with the ground as this will help the wood last longer and then also for your coop to last longer. Here are a couple of pictures representing the different styles of hen house with all these housing options that I will go through. There's many different styles and designs you can find, especially if you look for it on the internet. The picture on the right, you'll see the hen house that's in the middle of the pen instead of having a run attached to it. And the picture on the right you'll see the hen house with a smaller run attached to it. And then also at the end of that hen house, you'll see where the nesting boxes are and where you can lift that smaller roof section up to collect eggs from the nesting boxes. Next, we have the chicken tractor. In recent years, chicken tractors have become more popular as chickens have become more popular to be raised in backyards. A chicken tractor is a bottomless portable shelter that fits over garden beds is how they were originally designed. And you can see in this picture, they have a couple chicken tractors over their garden beds. Again, there's many designs of chicken tractors and they're most commonly used with fruit and vegetable production as chickens provide natural fertilizer and also insect control in gardens. Here you can see a couple other designs of chicken tractors. And here are some advantages and disadvantages to them. The advantages are they can be moved easily. They're not as permanent as a hen house or chicken coop. As I mentioned before, insect control and source of fertilizer is also an advantage. And their size makes them a good fit for more urban areas. Disadvantages are the ground can become barren if the chicken tractor is left there too long as the chickens will scratch and peck the dirt looking for those insects. They are semi labor intensive because they do require you to move them every day or two. And they're not made for a large amount of poultry. These are ideal if you only wanna have a couple of chickens. 
Next, we'll talk about lighting in the chicken coop. As I mentioned before, lighting plays an important role in egg productions of hens. Laying hens need adequate light year round. Hens molt and quit laying with decreased hours of light. This is a natural occurrence and it will happen in the winter time as the hours of natural light are decreased. Decreased light can also intensify aggressive behavior that hens have towards one another and decrease their feed and water intake. Photo period affects reproductive and egg production cycles. Again, total feed intake and growth rate. To maximize production, hens need 14 to 16 hours of daylight. To provide this light artificially during the winter time, you can use one 15 to 25 watt bulb and have it on a timer to provide light once the natural light goes away. And this will help reduce aggressive behavior, help them keep a more normal feed and water intake and encourage that during colder weather and also continue to lay eggs and not have decreased production during the winter. Here it lists um, two bulbs. This is so you have one for a backup in case the one that you're using goes out. Chickens usually lay one egg every 25 hours, just to kind of give you an idea of their normal egg laying cycle. So again, having an artificial source of light in your hen house or coop isn't required. I know a lot of people that don't, and while their hens do decrease egg production during the winter, they're still usually able to get an adequate number of eggs for their family. That will depend though on the number of hens you have and how many eggs um, your family goes through. But it is an option when you're considering building your hen house or coop to add a light to it. Next, we'll discuss ventilation. Ventilation is very important to have in your hen house or chicken coop, and it is important year round. So Unlike light, ventilation is required and a very important thing to consider when you are designing or looking at a possible design for housing for your chickens. To add ventilation, you can place windows on the south side of the hen house. This ensures light and warmth during the winter months and it is advised to use slanted window seals to discourage chickens from roosting on these window seals. You can also place vents on the south or east side of your chicken coop. Chickens cannot sweat, so they start to pant around 95 degrees Fahrenheit. This is one of the reasons why it is so important to have good ventilation because in those summertime months, as we all know, it gets pretty hot and humid here in Southeast Kansas. So we wanna make sure the housing for our chickens has good ventilation so the chickens will get airflow through their house and not get too hot in the summertime. And dampness and ammonia, the smell of ammonia can also occur if there's not adequate ventilation. And those are also signs that you need to add more ventilation to the coop. And this is also why ventilation is important during the winter as well as in the summer, because we don't want those coops getting damp and having that ammonia smell in the winter. You can also insulate the roof and walls if you're going to build more of a chicken coop style. This will reduce summer heat, reduce moisture accumulation, and also help keep your chickens warmer during the winter time. Next up, we have nesting boxes. Nesting boxes are an important part of your chicken coop or hen house because this is where the hens will lay their eggs or hopefully lay their eggs. So you'll want to provide one nest box for every four to five hens. It's very common for hens to share a nest box and you want these nesting boxes to be about 12 by 12 in size. You can make the nesting boxes out of a variety of different material, including wood, 
metal or plastic as seen in the bottom picture. They just used five gallon, gallon buckets for their nesting boxes, or you can also purchase nesting boxes that are ready made if that is your preference. It's recommended to place them on the east or west wall for a south facing coop. And adding a landing board in front of the nest box for easier entrance and exit for the hens is also rec recommended. The bottom picture does a good job of showing that dowel placed in front of the nesting boxes to give them that landing board. That way they can uh, fly up there, perch, and then go into the nesting box. And of course, it's very important to provide either straw or shavings as bedding in the nesting boxes to prevent those eggs from breaking. And if you do have a problem encouraging your hens to lay in the nesting boxes, sometimes they do decide even having those nesting boxes there, they wanna lay them someplace else. Getting a fake egg and placing it in the nesting box will help encourage hens to use those nesting boxes. Next up, we have roosts. Chickens naturally look for a place to roost at night. This gets them off the ground where they have a little bit more protection from predators. You'll want to allow eight to nine inches of roost space per bird and space roosts about 12 to 14 inches apart. To build roosts, you can use one and a half inch dowels or two by two lumber works well. You can also see in the bottom picture here that branches work well also for roosts. You may have to teach birds how to use the roost, although typically they'll naturally look for places to roost. In these pictures, it shows the roost inside of a chicken coop or a hen house. You can also place roosts outside in the run as well. Although if your run isn't secure and you'll need to lock your chickens up at night in the hen house or coop to protect them from predators, I would recommend only having the roosts in the coop as if they're in the run or pen you have for the chickens, they may try to roost outside at night where they won't have the protection from predators. But there are several options here for roosts. Okay, next we'll talk about feed and water. Feed and water are both very important for chicken care as they're both essential for our chickens and us as well to survive. We'll start off by water. Of course, it's important to have a water supply that is constant, fresh, and clean. Water will, water intake will vary greatly with the weather as of course chickens will consume more water in the summertime when it's hot versus the winter time when it's cold. And in the winter during the cold, like the really cold weather we had the past two weeks, it is important to also make sure that their water is um, unthawed, it isn't frozen where they can still access the water. And they do make um, chicken water heaters that you can use in colder weather or you can bring hot water out to those chickens. Water placement is also important. You want to place it fairly close to their feed within 15 feet. You don't want them to have to travel a long distance between their feeder and the waterer. And in the summertime, in those warmer months, it's recommended to place the water in the shade as that will keep the water temperature cooler for the chickens and encourage them to drink more water. In the picture here, you can see the classic type of chicken water. This type of water works great. There's also metal ones that are similar because you can fill it up and the water supply will last um, chickens usually a couple days unless you have a large number of chickens. It's also important, especially if you have young chicks, to have this style of water versus a bucket um, because um, chicks are prone to drowning in just an open bucket of water where this one just has the little trough and there's not the danger of them drowning in it. In this picture, the water is also a little bit above ground level. This makes it a little bit more comfortable and convenient for adult chickens 
to drink out of and also helps keep the water cleaner as it is up above the dirt and isn't as likely to get that dirt or other debris knocked into it from chickens scratching around. Yeah, I just saw the question here on how to keep the water clean. So changing out the water every couple days, even if the chickens haven't gone through it, is important, especially in warmer months when algae is more likely to build up in it. And when you do this, you can also um, spray the water out and get a scrub brush as needed. And also keeping it up above the dirt, like shown in the picture, will help keep their water cleaner. Okay. All right, next we'll talk about feeders. There's a couple different styles of feeders. There's the hanging system that you can see in the top picture. This system will require you to raise and lower the feeder based on bird height. You'll want the outer lip of the feeder level with the bird's back. This will make it a convenient height where the chickens can reach it easily to get to their food. This type of system keeps feed clean and helps prevent spillage and spoilage of feed. This type of feeder is also handy because it allows you to um, provide more feed for the chickens. So for example, if you're gonna be out of town for a couple of days you, and you just had a few chickens, you could fill this up at, with feed and that would keep them well fed while you're gone. And then you might just have to ask a neighbor or a friend to just stop by and check on them, but they wouldn't have to deal with filling the feeder. There's also a trough feeder system. However, this system does make chickens a little bit more susceptible to disease because with this system, they're more likely to kick feed out on the ground or feed is more prone to get um, spoiled, especially if it's outside and it happens to rain. Although more chickens can be fed on this system as you can make the trough as long or as short as desired based on the number of chickens you have, where with the hanging system, you would have to get a couple different hanging feeders if you had a large amount of chickens. And on this slide, we have a quick chart here on what not to feed your chickens. So chickens are great about eating kitchen scraps such as lettuce and tomatoes and different vegetables so that they don't go to waste. However, there are some things that you don't want to feed them such as green potato peels, citrus, uh, dried or undercooked beans, and you also don't want to feed them raw eggs. Raw eggs aren't harmful to them, but if they if you feed them raw eggs, then they'll get a taste for those eggs and they may start breaking and eating the eggs in the nesting boxes before you're able to collect them. And of course, you don't wanna feed them any candy, chocolate or sugar because while we find those things tasty and a nice treat, um, they're bad for chicken systems and chocolate is poisonous to most pets and chickens aren't an exception to that. Okay, finishing up here, we'll talk a little bit about predator protection. Predators are um, kind of like the number one threat to chickens. You usually don't have very many problems with disease, especially if you have just a couple of hens, but predators are a problem no matter how many chickens you have. So daytime threats are dogs, cats, foxes, hawks, and coyotes, while nighttime threats are more commonly cats, raccoons, possums, owls, and other rodents. Predators are reluctant to travel across open spaces. So if possible, you wanna place your chicken coop or pen in a more open area that doesn't have trees nearby. Poultry have a sixth sense in open air, which helps them detect when a predator is nearby. So having as little tree cover around their coop helps them detect predators. And dogs apply is to not just, you know, a loose dog that may be running through the neighborhood, but also if you have 
dogs as well. You may have to do some training with them if you want your chickens to free range in the yard during the day so the dogs know that those chickens are off limits because chickens are naturally a prey animal and dogs are naturally a predator. To make your chicken coop and pen more predator proof, you will want to make sure you have secure latches on the doors and windows of your coop so you can lock your chickens up at night. If you have windows in your coop or hen house, you'll want to staple heavy wire screening inside of those windows and vents so that you can keep them open in the summertime to provide that important airflow for the chickens, but still keep them safe from predators. If you have outdoor runs for your chickens, you'll want to, of course, fence those and bury the fencing about six to 12 inches deep in the ground. And this is so that predators can't dig under the fencing. And you may also want to consider fencing over the top of the coop as well. Usually hawks and owls are the biggest threat to chickens or to chicks and younger chickens that are easier for them to carry off. And that wraps up everything I had today. I would be happy to take any more questions at this time, or if you think of a question later, you can reach out to me through one of our office locations. Okay, last call for questions for Adavin. Here we have one. See a couple in the chat here. Um, the first one is, should I cancel my lawn chemical service? If you plan for your chickens to have access to the lawn, I would um, first talk to um, your lawn company, see what product they use. Some products are safe for chickens while others are not. So you may be able to talk to them and they can switch to a different product or if the product isn't safe and they don't have a different option, then I would cancel the service if your chickens have access to that lawn um, because you don't want them to be poisoned by any um, insecticides or herbicides that they're using. Next question. Um, when you talked about eggs earlier, I've been told not to wash them immediately as they won't last as long if you do. Yes, so there are mixed theories on washing eggs or not after you collect them. And doing a thorough wash on them, like scrubbing them with soap and water sort of wash, isn't recommended as that will take the outside coating off the shell, which will reduce their shelf life. Um, when I say washing eggs, I'm more referring to I'm just taking more like a damp rag and just quickly like wiping off any manure or straw that may be stuck to them. That way you don't have that sitting in your egg carton. Yeah, and the next question is, in a warm climate, can chickens sleep in a secure run? Yes, they can. Um, my parents, they live in Southern Nevada. They're in the desert. And um, my mom's chickens, they have a secure run and in the warmer months during the summer, um, she will have hens that decide to roost outside. So that could be a common occurrence in the summer, even here in Southeast Kansas. And as long as the run is secured where they have protection from predators, um, yep, that would be just fine. And then the next question, is it, okay to uh, throw feed corn kernels outside in their pen to give them something to do eat, is that okay? Yes, that is just fine. Um, the feeder style I talked about, that is most important when you're feeding um, a grower ration to broilers or you're feeding um, layer mash to your hens as their main food supply. You want to make sure that's in a feeder that is clean and um, won't have any 
or isn't as likely to have any contamination from dirt or manure, that sort of thing, but it's fine to throw out corn or scratch feed on the ground for uh, chickens to kind of like scratch and peck through. Um, just don't give them any more than they're able to finish up with in a day, especially more usually within a few minutes for them to peck through and eat. That way you don't have that feed going bad or that feed getting wet where then they might get sick from feed that has spoiled. The next question is, do chickens recognize you like a pet? I wouldn't say that they recognize you like your dog or cat would, but I know um, growing up, we would take uh, kitchen scraps out to the chickens and they definitely recognize us walking out the back door with that bowl in our hand that we always took scraps out. So they probably won't recognize you quite as well as a dog or cat would, but they do have some recognition there, especially when it's feed time. They'll start listening for that door and getting excited, maybe waiting at the gate to their coop when they see you come out. Yeah, the next question is from our Q&A section and is what kind of feed is needed and how much per chicken? So the feed needed will depend on the growth stage of the chicken. And if you're raising broilers or if you're raising um, hens for egg production. So for younger chicks, you'll usually have a starter or a grower ration that you can get from the feed stores. Um, broilers will also have that grower ration or a more specific ration made for meat chickens to give them the nutrient levels they need for their faster growth rate. And then for hens, you'll have a layer um, mash or crumbles to feed them. And then there's also, as I mentioned a couple minutes ago, scratch that you can give them as well. And then I believe on the slide I had a little bit ago, it talked about how much feed per chicken um, so for broiler chickens, one chicken in, usually takes average five weeks for them to grow. They will go through nine pounds on average in those five weeks. But again, that's a broiler chicken. They're known for that fast growth rate. Um, a typical chicken won't go through that much feed. So you're talking um, less than a pound a day. I don't have specific numbers off the top of my head. I apologize. Um, but usually um, like a, just like a scoop, a feed scoop of scratch is what I throw out to about six hens. And then you can free feed chickens um, no matter what feed you're going with, whether it's grower or layer mash, you can free feed them in those feeders so they'll eat um, what they need. So it's not quite as specific when it comes to feeding them as it is a horse or a dog. Um, and I can get more information on that to give to you. The next question is um, keeping new hens in their cooper run for two weeks before letting them free range. Is that good practice? Yes, that is a good practice. Like you uh, mentioned in your question, that way they learn to lay and roost there. Yes, that is a great practice. It helps them know that's where they need to lay their eggs. That's where they have shelter because they are in a new environment. So if you were let, to let them free range, they might pick a tree or another area that isn't ideal instead. The next question is, how do you introduce new chickens? Um, so as mentioned in the previous question, you'll want to leave new chickens locked up in the coop for a couple of weeks so they get adjusted to their new environment and that's where they live. Um, for introducing new hens, that's a little bit easier. There's no specific way if they're adults and you have other adult chickens, um, you'll just 
add them to the flock. There may be a little bit of not necessarily fighting, but pecking and bickering back and forth between the hens as they get used to the new pecking order. And that's natural. Um, they're just figuring out who's in charge. If you have, if you're like introducing a new rooster and you already have a rooster, that gets a little trickier because roosters are more territorial. So they're more likely to fight, to establish who's in charge and whose hen flock it is. Some people have um, put the roosters next to one another. So there's a fence dis, um, dividing them. So they can't, they'll still try and fight. They won't get to each other as much through the fence, of course. So then they can get acclimated to one another and get more used to the ideal that there's another rooster there and do it like that for a few days before you add them to the flock. However, roosters, they'll still be a little bit of fighting there. And then if you're introducing um, new chicks to the flock, um, usually you'll just want to let those chicks get a little bit older. Of course, you don't wanna do it with freshly hatched chicks as they'll need to be in that brooder and have that heat lamp as an extra source of heat, um, but then once they're big enough to introduce to the flock, um, I have just let them out with the other hens. Usually the other hens aren't bothered by them at all, and it's safe to do so. Again, especially with introducing chicks to the flock, you'll want them keep to keep them locked up in the coop or hen house so they know that's where they're supposed to be, that's where their food, their water, and their shelter is. Um, yeah, so there's not an exact way to introduce new chickens to the flock. Usually chickens are more mellow compared to other animals with the exception of roosters. So you just add them to the flock and then they'll kind of sort it out from there. Is there a rule of thumb for number of roosters? There isn't a rule of thumb. Um, usually I've found it works best if you have at least five hens for each rooster. Usually one rooster will be the dominant one and the other rooster will kind of lose out and maybe only get a couple of hens. Um, I will say that if you, like for example, if you get a group of chicks and there ends up being three roosters out of the eight chicks and all of those roosters grow up together and they're always together and you never separate them, I've had that worked out, work out where all those roosters are fine together and get along. There will be the one rooster that is kind of the one in charge and has most of the hens, but he really won't fight or bother the other roosters. Um, you get into problems when you introduce a new rooster to a flock or you separate those roosters and then put them back together. Then they get territorial and we'll try and fight. Um, so at least um, five hens for every one rooster. You don't want to have any fewer hens than that and have multiple roosters because then those roosters will get hard on the hens and they can cause the hens to lose their feathers. Okay, I think I got all the questions from the chat box and the Q&A box. Are there any more questions or any that I missed? Well, Adevan, thank you so much for this great presentation and thank you for everyone uh, for joining us here today. I think we're all ready to go out and raise some chickens. Uh, <laughs> this program will be posted to the library's YouTube channel so you can go back and view it again. And thanks again, everybody, for joining us. Thanks for having me. And if anyone has any more questions, you can reach me at the extension office. Um, I'm usually at the independence office and that phone number is 620-331-2690. But of course you can reach out to any of our offices, our closest office location to Pittsburgh is our Gerard office and they can get you in contact with me. Thanks again, everyone.